repellents. There, Nancy's fond of saying there's uh, many ways to catch a mouse. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of repellents out there. And here's some good, good rules of thumb, at least in the world of natural repellent. If you flip over the bottle, you look for the active ingredient and uh, you want at least 4% and you probably don't need any more than 15%. Um, less than 4%, you're buying water, no matter what magic is in there. And more than 15%, uh, it's a little like getting SPF 200. You think, why? Mm-hmm. And then not, not always. That's not always true, but for the most part. And also it starts to not feel very nice on your skin. So you're looking for a range. And when you're in that range, it's not like 8% is better than 6%. Like once you're in the range, you're good. The second thing to do is count. Count the number of active ingredients. It's such a simple thing to do, but more is better. Um, when a plant tears its leaf, yeah. um, what it releases is the volatile. And th- that volatile will repel herbivores because it doesn't want. And you want multiple repellents um, for multiple way, um, layers of, of, of keeping the bugs away. And so you don't need much of each ingredient, but you want multiples. Um, so that's the second thing you look for. Mm-hmm. And then you, you actually give it the sniff test. And here's an interesting thing. If it doesn't smell good, it's not going to work. Um, and the reason it won't work is because you're not going to use it. You're going to put a little bit on your hand and yeah. think, uh, you know, is, is that going to be enough? And that's, that's not going to be enough. Mm-hmm. And so you want to do the sniff test. And the, the other thing to look for is how do I get it on my body? How do I get it from there to me? Because if you're smearing it on your hand or around your ears, um, you've got it in certain location. You've got it there. Um, is it a cream? Is it a spray? We actually, one of our things that is in our bottles, it's actually what isn't in our bottles, is we have no emulsifiers. We think people don't mind giving it a little shake um, because without an emulsifier, you can do a fine mist trigger spray and get this really broad coverage. And so the, the thing to look for is how do you get it onto your body and how's it going to be covered? Because uh, applying it the right way makes a difference. And so if you look for those factors, you know, well after you've forgotten about Nantucket spider, you're in a different part of the world, yeah. that will give you sort of guidance into how do I pick among these different products. If I can just add to that, sure. um, you know, the, an emulsifier is, is the thing that mixes oil and water together. And the ones that are allowed by the EPA in minimum risk repellents like ours, yeah. are, turn it to a milky consistency. Or people make their products with like 20% soybean oil or something like that. And the thing is, you can't spray that on your clothing or your hair or your gear without staining. And, and, and the little spray no- nozzles get stuck. They, they, they get stuck too, but you but you need to be able to mist it on your clothing as well. And, and if somebody has sensitivity, you want to put it on your socks and shoes for the tick in particular, and you want to be able to have that flexibility. And I think that that's a rare thing in repellents, and ours does that. Yeah, and so you brought up the scent, and I've looked at, you guys have quite the extensive ingredient list in uh, each of your products. How do you bring all of those together and still smell so good? Is that, was that like hard to get right? Or? Well, sometimes so, some scents can be overwhelming. Uh-huh. And there are things that work, but they don't smell good. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a bit of an art. Yeah. And um, I, I often get Nancy saying, smell this. What do you think of this? <laughs> well, for the first few years until we got kind of sick of smelling it, Jeffrey would like he would get out of the car and take grab a bottle of it and mist it over himself before. I'm like, what is, what is that? It's not cologne. Like, what you? <laughs> but you know, and and having said that, our our tick repellent is stronger, and some people find it a strong scent, and it's one reason why it's like we, a spicy vanilla. Yeah, and it's one reason why we recommend that um, it be focused on, for ticks. It's, yeah. it's long lasting, and you should apply it really thoroughly on your legs and socks and shoes but i i don't like it around my face i find it heavy but some and, people and love got, it my kid my kids prefer it so they use it all the time as their bug spray can you kind of break down of what the different formulas are we kind of touched on some of them briefly sure um go ahead i was gonna say go ahead okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay so our original repellent and our summer camp which has no citronella in it they have um, a range of things such as rosemary and lemongrass. Um, one has citronella, one doesn't. They have peppermint and spearmint and clove. Um, geranium. Geranium. Ro- they all have rose geranium, which is a gr- an essential ingredient for repelling ticks. Yeah. Um, and they all um, they're all made with essential oils. One of the other things that you find in cheaper, low end 
not sort of so-called natural sprays is people will use geranol or eugenol. And geranol is not from geranium oil. It's a cheap derivative of citronella. Our products use high-quality organic essential oils, and, and I think that that makes a big difference in, in the wearability and the scent. And um, anyway, those two are light and lemon fresh, and they have no oil in them. They're, they, they sm- people really like the way they smell. The dog one has no citrus ingredients because a lot of the time dogs are sensitive to c- citrus ingredients. Mm-hmm. It also has no clove oil, a, an ingredient of particular sensitivity to dogs. It has cedar wood and uh, rose geranium, uh, rosemary, and it does have peppermint. And it's interesting, peppermint has become... We, we've been hearing this year, uh, people are saying, oh, I heard that peppermint oil is toxic for dogs. And when we look into it, we see that there are some recommendations Oh, t- that people will say peppermint oil is toxic for dogs. But when you dig into it, it's because people, with their lack of wisdom, have been adding essential oils to dog food to try to freshen dogs' breath. Essential oils are not food, for the most part. You don't mm-hmm. certainly don't feed them to your pets. And so that's the nature of the warning, but it's absolutely fine to have it as a spray. We've sold 60,000 bottles of it without a, without a toxicity issue on dogs, and we we're confident that it's not a problem for dogs. And then the tick one is a very different formulation. It, it Again, it's made with all organic se- essential oils. It has some of them in a higher concentration. Again, it's not lemony because cit- um, the citrus ingredients aren't particularly useful against ticks. It has cinnamon, um, which is a very effective, but also very strong. And it's, it's what's known as a hot oil. Like that's yeah. that's why some you'd want to use it on your lower body. You, you, like hot oils, you don't really want on your lips. Okay. Um, we, you know, we don't recommend yeah. it for pets because of the hot oils. It has clove and and cinnamon. Um, and then the other thing, it has a very it has a unique ingredient. It has natural vanillin. And vanillin is not vanilla. And okay. one of the things I, th- I thought is, let's just use vanilla. Turns out that vanilla has um, doesn't have much vanillin in it. Most of the vanillin that we see in flavoring and stuff um, comes from horrible places. It comes from pulp and paper waste and other unsavory um, things. Our, our vanillin is from cloves. Okay. Cloves, ha- for some reason, have a higher concentration of vanillin. And the role of vanillin is quite important because it binds with the essential oils so they don't evaporate quickly. One of the problems with natural repellents it, that people often hear is they don't last. Yeah. And they, you know, they're volatile, they evaporate. This one doesn't evaporate. It takes a long time to go away. So if you spray it on your socks and shoes, the next day you still smell it. Like it, it works for a really long time. Yeah, I guess it. That's yeah, it, right? I, think, I think that's right. Um, so that with bug repellent, you really do know when it's time to reapply, but you don't with tick repellent. So it's really important to make sure that it that it that it stay on well after you stop thinking about it because you're not going to hear a buzzing in your ear to remind you. Yeah, yeah. With now all these different formulas and all the the mosquitoes, the flies, the ticks that you're looking to repel, you guys have actually done quite a bit of testing to see the efficacy of it. Can you share with us a little bit about that in that process? So the um we we know that the tick repellent repels 92% of deer ticks and the regular and the and the summer camp both repelled 99% of all the mosquitoes they were tested against. So we, we know they're really effective. And the dog has a lot of the essential ingredients for the, that are in the other one. So we know that it has what you need to repel ticks. We haven't had it tested yet because of the cost. It's very expensive. Yeah. One of the things that we are going to be doing this year is a lot more testing on all of them. But unfortunately, commercially, you can't just send it off to get it tested against certain flies and stable flies and stuff like that we're going to have to uh, arrange for those tests to be done ourselves. And that's a, you know, that will be a process. Yeah. Some of the states require efficacy testing in order to register labels. And and so we've met that threshold for those three products, and we will be doing it for the dog as well and and um, and, right. the, and the sticks, which we haven't and talked y- about. And you wonder how they, d- how they do tick testing i mean you, you, yeah you, you know i don't know if people imagine people subjects who put their arm in a, a, a tick tank it, it, that's not it <laughs> okay like i i mean who do you even find to test for tick repellent i don't know well, that's not no, easy. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> in fact they hadn't they and so the way yeah. they the way they do it is they take ticks and they um put them in a petri dish that's got some sort of a cloth on it and they they put it on its side and the tick will walk from the bottom of the petri dish to the top and if they'll do yeah. that in a certain period of time, then they're walkers and they're eligible for the study. And they take the eligible ticks 
and they put them in another petri dish, only this time there's a midline with the repellent. And they put the tick at the bottom. If the tick is willing to cross into the repellent area, uh-huh. the repellent isn't repellent. And so in that context, it repelled 92% of the deer ticks. And that's actually an important thing about bug repellent in general. As, as I was saying earlier, how, how you put it on, if you've got a wonderful, wonderful repellent on your leg and you bump into a tick, the tick can't jump off. There's no jump ability. It's like all the tick can do is wander to where you don't have the repellent and work its way up. And so what you want is something that's going to create a sort of a barrier yeah. and that it's broad enough that they can't find their way around to work their way up where they're going to do damage, um, like getting behind your ear and your armpit or you know, back of your You know, I was, I, when you've been talking about that, Jeffrey, I, it might be a good idea to talk about ticks in general because if people understand, one of the things we do when we make a product is we study the behavior of what, we, what it is that we're trying to repel. Yeah. And so for black flies, for example, they crawl on your ears and your know, hairline and so having something you can't spray in your hair is, is useless against black flies. Mm-hmm. Um, mosquitoes, of course, they, some of them go for your ankles. You know, it's, it's where you apply things. We all know more instinctively about mosquitoes because we feel them. Yeah. You know, flies go on your head. And, and, but ticks, are, you know, ticks were, have been around forever, but they've had surprisingly little study about them. And part of it is because they're hard to collect and hard to test and hard to find. Mm-hmm. But... I, th- I think it's important when you when you think about what you're trying to repel to understand the life cycle of them so that you can use strategies that actually work. So ticks have uh, three stages of life after they hatch their um, larva. Mm-hmm. And the larva are 100% on the ground. And that's where, because the ticks lay their eggs on the ground. So you may have seen a cat or dog run up to your door and they have like 100 ticks right on their face. Those are larvae that they've managed to find and stick their face in. Larvae are not born infected, and they don't with Lyme. Trans- with Lyme, and they don't transmit disease. They're very, very tiny, uh-huh. and they, you know, they usually are a cluster when they bite. After they feed on their first host, the larvae drop off and they molt into nymphs. The nymphs are also almost entirely in the, the first six inches of the ground. They're on the grass. They're in leaf litter and. Uh, they like damp places, so if you if a lawn isn't a particularly good habitat, so if you trim your lawn and you keep away the brush on the outside of it, you're going to reduce the tick population okay. of, for nymphs. Now, nymphs can be infected depending on who they fed on the first time. Most of them feed on probably rodents or squirrels or birds or chipmunks. And the nymphs are, are small and they're hard to see. They get on you from the ground and they crawl up. And the reason so many people think that things are fa- jumping on them from the trees because they find ticks behind their ears and in their hair, they don't start there. They come up from the ground and they can move pretty quickly. And so that's why it's so important to make a barrier with your repellent on your feet and your socks and shoes and anything that's coming into contact with brush. If you're lifting brush, you put it on your arms and your hands as well. And then the, um, the nymphs molt one more time and only the adult females feed the third time the males will hitch a ride but the females will attach and so knowing that you're what you're really really trying to do is stop nymph bites and adult female bites it just seems like a more manageable thing and the adult females will crawl up to waist high and brush so if you're you know if you are walking through something deeper you may pick up adult females and at least the um the deer ticks you bump into them for the most part when they get when you're within a few feet of a deer tick, it will, it will grab on to where it's at and start waving its howler claws, hoping that you'll bump into to them. Uh-huh. And so once you're on it, you know, it, its leg structure is such that it's not going to be able to get off of you very easily, and it can't hop off. There, there's, no, uh, there's no hop ability. And so there's nowhere for it to go, you know, except yeah. uh, it, it, maybe it won't attach or maybe it won't work its way up. I'm a hobbyist beekeeper. Um, and two summers ago, I was, uh, and, and I wear a hazmat suit, basically. I'm a terrible beekeeper. My <laughs> friends just have a veil, but I wear everything. And you can always see, when I come out of the field, the ticks on you. They're little black dots. And it's yep. it, it's creepy, but it's nice because, you know, you can see them all. Right. When we came out with our tick product, I was very good about spraying it before I'd go out into the apiary. And I don't know, two years ago, I forgot. And I went out, and I got out into the middle of the field, and I thought, I forgot. And so I go running back to my car. 
I grabbed the bottle, but I'm a middle-aged, out-of-shape man, and I was too out of breath. 